Okay, so I think we are already live. And so, hello, hello everyone. Uh, hello from Barcelona, so, and from uh, Austria, so, and from around the world. So let's see today uh, what we can learn from, from Andy and uh, what we can do. I would like to basically uh, uh, say a few words about uh, uh, all of, all of well, all the things that are happening. So basically, I hope all of you are safe and are keeping safe with you and your families. And so I hope uh, you, we will enjoy this session. So let me start first and share my screen to explain a little bit what is the Barcelona Joke uh, community and what we can do and what we normally do. Right. So I will still a few minutes from from you, Andy. That's OK. OK. Uh, so that's it. Let me see. So I guess you can see my screen now. You can see, see a beautiful logo, Barcelona, with a funny duke and the Sagrada Familia below, right? Um, so yeah, basically, let's go. So many people know that we are, um, uh, let's say, a, a, a nonprofit organization. Uh, and we started more than eight years ago. And we are mainly um, Java developers interested in technology. So that's why we are here, no? We want to learn and we are curious about technology. And we normally, well, we met before in person to to run things, to to, to prepare things, to uh, have a look on different technologies. And, and basically we try to uh, to play with different technologies and, 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 and grow as a, as a developer. And yeah, everything related with Java, but not only with Java. So for many people that doesn't know uh, about us, we have a few links here where you can join us. I would say that normally many people join us by the meetup, but we have already uh, Twitter, also uh, Instagram. Uh, also, we have a Slack. It's it's also a really good place to communicate with other people from Barcelona and around the world. And yeah, we have more content that we normally put in, in YouTube to, to see all the sessions that we have. So yeah, we did a lot of events last year, but we we still are growing for this year and more. So yeah, and yes, we have also we did. Um, it was not this year; it was previously. We organized. Uh, that's the fifth edition of the JBC and Conf. It was a great conference, and I hope we will be able to make it happen again. And it was really really funny thing for all the people that attended, and it was really a, a great experience. I would say. So yeah, let's see if, what we can do for let's say next edition. Um, yeah, that's the funny thing about organizing that you met friends. Yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah, for the next year, we hope in July we will be able to make it happen again. Yeah. So yeah, for today I have to say thank you for uh, Jakarta E and JetBrains uh, because thanks for Jakarta E we have this connection and for JetBrains for uh, uh, providing us some free license for IntelliJ. So let us know later on because we will have some license to give you if you are interested. And uh, yeah, I think pretty much basically I normally say that you have to do something and then probably at some point somebody will give you Back something so that's why we invite, we invite everybody to join the community and do a few things even contribute to open source why not please do it if you're not doing it and yeah pretty much for me that's that's the, the, the minutes that i would like to steal from you andy so for today we have uh, andy um i have to say that it's a pleasure for me to to uh, to have it have you here uh, Andy is a dev rel for captain and basically has a great background in performance engineering and he, he worked in different performance monitoring and testing tools so i think it's going to be really interesting what you want to share with us today and yeah i think pretty much so Perfecto. let me stop sharing and you can do it then. Uh, Perfecto. Yes. Good Spanish, by the way. <laughs> ah, gracias. Pero creo que es, es, uh, es mejor que yo hablo inglés porque <laughs> mi español es no, no mejor. Uh, but thanks for, thank you so much. You, didn't, you don't steal time from me. You give me a lot of time so that I can talk about things that I am passionate about and also that I've learned over the years. And it's great to have people like you that run communities around the world. Um, so let me share my screen here. Uh, I will put this window over and then I will share 
Here we go, and perfect. So I do have, as you can see here, my captain with me um, and some other things, but I want to first kick it off with uh, a little intro. And by the way, I encourage everyone uh, to ask questions. I think you are moderating, right, when questions come in? Yep, I tried, yep. Perfect. Um, I may not see these, so that's why it's great that you moderate. Um, yep. And we also have a couple of polling questions prepared, which I think one of those we are having up right now because my talk today is going to be, <clears throat> you know, it's I know it's a mouthful of buzzwords, uh, but please be aware that I'm not going to do a lot of buzzword or bullshit bingo, as we call it. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of hopefully interesting information for you uh, that you can take take with you. But uh, my talk is really focused on a new approach to continuous delivery, to automating operations. Site reliability engineering plays a big role in it, and especially the concept of SLIs and SLOs, so service level indicators, service level objectives. And I believe the first uh, polling question should actually be up because I want to get a little feel on um, on if you are actually aware of what all of this means what are service level objectives so i think you should have a little polling option yep it's already here but not many people are under it so i guess uh, well at least the people that already answer say that they, they don't know what it is is it's hello yeah. so um yeah maybe give them a couple more seconds yep. yeah mm -hmm. perfect so in case you like what you see today uh what you see here is a couple of links that you can follow up with me later on either it's my my Twitter handle or my LinkedIn, but really what I'm going to show you today is a lot around Captain. Captain is a CNCF, a Cloud Native Computing Foundation sandbox project right now. So sandbox is kind of the first state uh, in, in a CNCF open source project. You would do us a favor if you give us feedback, if you want and love what you see, join the community, star us on, on Git, <clears throat> join the Slack channel. Uh, I think we have the link to the Captain website also in on the bottom of your screen. You'll see uh, Captain website, uh, and yeah, and also feel free to follow us. And we're always looking for contributors. So yeah. Now <clears throat> it seems it's a quiet audience. Not a whole lot are. Yeah, are answering no, questions. Exactly, but... exactly. They're not really <laughs> engaged with answering, just pressing one button. But I guess half of people say that they they they, they started to use it for some, and and mm -hmm. the rest they say they don't know what is okay the service level objective. So perfect. Well then, yeah. let's let's go into this, and it already gives me a feeling that there's definitely going to be in something in for you, for those that um that know uh, the things uh, SLO already for those that don't know it. Okay, so let me get started. So Captain, what is Captain actually, right? So the idea with Captain is we want to make life easier for you. For you, in your case, we are, um, I assume, a large uh, Java-based developer crowd. And if you're moving towards Kubernetes and building your containers, then what we want you to use captain for is or what you want need to do is the first thing is you can select which use case you want to use captain for i will cover all of them later on but one could be progressive delivery one could be quality gate evaluation based on slis and slos and the other one is auto remediation so the first thing you need to do is select which use case you're interested in then depending on your use case you simply bring your configuration uh, these are yaml files that allow you to specify the process that Captain should use, the SLIs and SLOs, which we'll learn later on more, or runbooks that Captain should automate for auto remediation. And then, once you've installed Captain, you can also connect Captain to the tools that you want to use. So Captain is not replacing tools; Captain is an orchestrator across all of your tools that you have to implement the use case that you want to automate. So really, what Captain does, and this is a little screenshot. Um, Captain is automating progressive delivery if you wanted to, quality gates if you wanted to, auto remediation if you wanted to, configuring your monitoring, pulling up metrics. Everything is declarative, as you will see later on. Uh, we are following in the GitOps approach. That means all the configuration files will end up in Git, and also our events are triggered based on Git changes or can be if you want to. Uh, everything is SLO based, so everything Captain does will be evaluated against service level objectives. And very importantly, it's an open source project, and all of our communication is based on cloud events, which are standards, so that we we connect and talk with the tools through open standards, which means no vendor login, no nothing. You can just uh, integrate any type of tooling. So this is what Captain is. Uh, next thing is why we built Captain. 
because you may think later on, well, something like this already exists. Um, well, the thing is, and, and I just took the stats from last week, the state of DevOps report for those of you that have uh, some knowledge of, of the DevOps market. Uh, there's a puppet lab is always conducting the state of DevOps report and the last came out last Friday. And they're saying that 63% of the surveyed organizations, there's several thousand that they are asking questions, 36% are building internal delivery platforms. So they're building the next generation of the DevOps pipelines are based on top of the new technology stack. Now, where does Captain come into play? Well, we are addressing three major problems that we have seen organizations over the last couple of years in adopting and building new pipelines, new ways of delivery, new ways of automation. And these are now three numbers that I've taken from our own survey that we ran. And also when we engage with our Captain community, what they say, why they are using Captain. It's around uh, getting better with maintaining delivery pipelines. Uh, it's getting better with uh, not spending too much manual tasks along the delivery pipeline and also time spent in manual remediation. So these are three areas. <clears throat> and I also want to show you Captain today based on these three problem areas so that you will know and see what can Captain do for you. But then I'll also dive deeper in what it means for you as a developer. What does it mean for Kubernetes? Um, before I go into the first one, um, I think we have one more poll because I know I make a very bold statement here where I, when I say 95% of delivery engineering time is wasted in maintaining monolithic pipelines. Right? And there's a second poll now yep. that we just opened up. It is, it is already. So it basically is about um, uh, what, what it means continuous delivery, right? It's basically what, what the people understand about uh, continuous delivery and how how the people are using it or applying it, let's say. So because it's uh, really, really different, right? Exactly. And I think what I want to get out of this is, um, do you have no problems at all with continuous delivery? Everything is perfectly fine. Uh, or do you actually have challenges with continuous delivery? Because mm. if everything is fine in the world and nobody has any problems with continuous delivery and DevOps, then probably we're building a tool that nobody needs. But we'll see. So. So apparently there are a few votes and majority of the people, they say that, well, there are some manual steps to go from development to production. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. even people are sharing the tools, Terraform and Concourse. Of course, okay, CICD, uh, perfect, yeah. That's cool, that's cool. Yeah. Um, but the, I guess that many organizations have some manual steps, right, for, for arriving to different, True. yeah. True, 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 yeah. No, but this is great. This is very helpful. Um, and also, Michel, uh, Michel, I will also include, uh, you're using Terraform and Concourse, so I will also show you how Captain can help you uh, as you are already using tools that can do infrastructure as code automation and also do some delivery automation. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but let me get, let me get go, uh, back to uh, my slides here. So, why do I make this statement? What you see here is one of our Jenkins pipelines that we use internally at Dynatrace, the company where I work for. And the thing is, it is 350 plus lines long. That might not be the problem, but traditional pipelines, and also Jenkins is not a bad tool. I don't want to bash on Jenkins. But we also started with Jenkins for delivering our previous generation products because it was monolithic and it was all Java-based and Jenkins is perfect for that. But the problem with Jenkins in general is that if you look at the, the process definition, the Jenkins file, the pipeline, <clears throat> in that file you have mixed information about the process, the target platform where you want to deploy to, the environments and the tooling. Everything is pretty, let's say, static in there, right? I know you can obviously work with environment variables and parameters so you can make it slightly you know customizable and i've also seen people doing magic things with jenkins so i know it's possible to do more flexible things but in general you have mixed information and no clear separation of concerns about the process definition and what should actually happen which tools should be in, involved now this is one challenge i see the next challenge is here is a classical, very simple Jenkins pipeline that you may start with as you're moving over to Kubernetes and trying to figure out how do you want to deploy 
your containers on Kubernetes. You may start with, again, an existing tool that you know, like Jenkins, and you start with a simple pipeline that works well for your service. And then as you are getting successful, you may onboard more services in the same project. And typically, every service is slightly different. Um, therefore, you make some changes to fulfill the requirements of that particular service, because maybe you need an additional step and you need to an, an additional thing that needs to be configured to deploy it. And the problem with this, though, is right. if you then scale this, you end up with a lot of pipelines that are very customized, heavily customized based on the individual needs, all originating from the same thing. And, and therefore, when things break, it's very hard to maintain. Hmm. And this is exactly a problem that we see in many organizations out there. And now I want to show you a new approach that we have taken with Captain. And again, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to say that Captain is the only tool out there that follows that approach, but we want to show you what we as the open source project Captain are doing. Because we said, well, how can we solve this problem? How can we make this more flexible? We said, well, let's move to an event-driven delivery model. And I want to show you what this means. So the solution is, if you think about the left side here as your classical, your, your typical process, build, prepare, deploy, and test. And then maybe later on in your pipeline, you add a notifying Slack or maybe even a rollback action as you start going down into continuous delivery. This is basically a process that right now might be contained in one big pipeline file with hard dependencies to the tools that you're using. And every time you add a new step, you need to figure out which tools you, tool you integrate. Now, what we are saying is this is great in general for deploying, let's say, static applications that have very static number of components. But as we as developers have moved from building monolithic applications to more componentized service application service oriented or applications where we decouple things we then also said well we need a new way of connecting these individual components together and this happens through events and this is exactly what we are proposing for the continuous delivery so we say let's basically separate the concerns so let's break this monolith where process and tool definition is all together let's break it together uh, let's break it up and let's then have an orchestrator that orchestrates the process on the left. And just as in modern software architecture, we're using eventing to then say, hey, our process is currently in that stage. And therefore, based on the process definition, for instance, we need somebody that can deploy this particular container in this particular stage with this particular, let's say, blue-green strategy or canary strategy. And then what you have on the right side are basically your tools, your services. Actually, there are services that provide capabilities. And then they can register to these events. And then a tool can say, yes, uh, I, I'm, 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 I, may, I may be able to do blue-green in this environment. And so I'll take it, and then I'll do it. And then it sends back the event when it's done. So essentially, what we do is sim sim basically mimicking what we are doing in software architectures. We're building event-driven systems. But we're applying this to continuous delivery. So not a new concept, and maybe others have done it too, but here's how Captain does it. Captain will, is installed on Kubernetes. So Captain itself is a container-based solution where the core components or the core component is the control plane. This is actually the, the central logic that is actually uh, executing these workflows or orchestrating these workflows. It also provides an API and a UI to show you all the workflows that are executed, where the workflows are right now, and so on. It also uses an eventing layer for the actual eventing connection. Now, once you have installed Captain, we have, remember, the clear separation of concerns. That means if you want to use Captain, one team in your organization or one person in your team can define the so-called processes that Captain can orchestrate. We have two major processes. One is for delivery and one is for automatic remediation of production issues. That's why you see here the shipyard file and the remediation YAML. Shipyard means you can specify what's the delivery process, how many stages do you have, left dev staging and prod, and what should happen in each stage, like which type of testing should happen, which type of SLOs you want to enforce or SLAs. And then for the remediation process, if you have a problem in production, then you can specify what actions should be executed to remediate a problem. 
So you have one option to declaratively define your processes. And then you have another team that says, and by the way, here are the capabilities or here are the tools, the tool definition that can become part of that process once it's executed. So the way this works, we call it the uniform. You basically say, which tool should handle which type of event or which one is registering. And the great thing about this is you have a complete separation. That means you can actually change the process definition at any time. You can add a stage, remove a stage, change the testing strategy, or you can add or remove remediation actions. And on the other side, a completely different team can also change the tools. You can switch from one tool to another without having to look at all the pipelines where this tool is currently used because there is no hard-coded connection anymore. It all happens through events. And the beneficiary of this is the developer where if you have it if if you think about the delivery use case you can say i have a new artifact and now captain is executing your defined delivery workflow by sending events to do certain things like first change the configuration like the helm chart then do the deployment then do the tests then do the evaluation then do the promotion and so on and so forth so this is kind of the explanation of an event-driven architecture, which is applying it to continuous delivery. Does this make sense or any questions? At this point, there are no questions, but I don't know if it's more or less clear uh, about how 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 Captain is, is, is built, uh, but that I think it's more or less clear what it provides. It's kind what of, it uh, yeah. No. Um, not sure if somebody has any question at this point. If not, you can you can continue. I have one question related yeah. with um, with uh, Captain. You mentioned that is uh, has to let's say work in in Kubernetes, right? Yeah. So the the question I have is which which kind of dependencies does Captain get to bring to to the Kubernetes cluster? Let's say. That's a good question. So yes, Captain itself, first of all, runs on Kubernetes because we have decided to use Kubernetes for, for several reasons. And that means what we are installing are the Captain core components. We are also installing uh, NETS, it's spelled N-A-T-S. That is an open source eventing library. Uh, we're using uh, Cloud Events, which is just an open source specification for events. So this is just JSON objects. Um, we also, if you want to, do, um, let's say, uh, any type of progressive delivery, blue-green deployments, will, which I'll show you later on. And if you want to use the Helm support that, that is installed with Captain, you also need to install a service mesh because that's what we need. In our case, we require Istio. But the thing is, and this is also very important to understand, while Captain itself runs on Kubernetes and all these, these, uh, these tools on the bottom, they also run on that same Kubernetes cluster because they are getting the events. These the, the, the captain services here in purple, they are really just basically proxies to the actual tool. So for instance, you see here under deploy service, I have Jenkins listed. That means while captain runs on Kubernetes and it orchestrates the workflow, you can actually have captain trigger a Jenkins pipeline to do a certain thing. Or you can trigger, I think concourse was mentioned earlier. You can trigger concourse which means Captain is really there to orchestrate processes for you, but then the individual tools is you bring the tool that you want to use mm -hmm. for a particular job, right? So I, I, I can see it kind of uh, the root of what is going to happen in my pipeline, right? More exactly, or less. exactly, yeah? yeah. Okay, this is what and, I understand. Uh, yeah, and the other thing is also, um, I think the question that came in, came in earlier with Terraform and with uh, Concourse, so for Terraform, for instance, here we have a service that is called the Helm service that is doing a Helm apply, basically. <clears throat> you can also write a Terraform service where Captain, let's say as part of the configuration change, is triggering uh, a Terraform script. That's also completely possible, right? You can just write a, uh, an integration for that. Or for Concourse, I mentioned that Captain can call Concourse, but if you're using Concourse CI CD, then the other integration option that you have if you're using Concourse CI/CD right now for delivery, but let's say you want to use a capability of Captain, like the quality gate capability, which is one piece of the of the whole process, you can actually from Concourse say, Captain, I want you to execute a process, but just the quality gate. So that means you can use your existing pipeline and simply integrate a, a, a process that is orchestrated by Captain 
to say, give me a value at all of my SLOs and then return the value mm -hmm. for me. Right? That's also possible. Yes, for example, to evaluate how, for example, a process or a system or a service is working or how it behaves from yeah. different, yeah? Exactly. For instance, you do with your concourse or maybe you're using Argo or you're using Harness or any other tool, you're doing a canary deployment. You do the canary with that tool and at the end, you ask Captain, please evaluate my SLOs on that canary. It reports back uh, a score. I'll show you this later on. Mm -hmm. And then you can then, this, let's say concourse again, can then make a decision what to do if it's bad or what to do if it's good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. cool. Yeah. All right. So let me quickly go through the demo. So the demo that I want to show you is I have a three-stage delivery pipeline configured in Captain. I have my version number three deployed <clears throat> of my of my service on my Kubernetes cluster. And then the only thing I need to do is I basically say, hey, I'm the developer. I have a new version available. And then what Captain does for me, it executes the process, which means it deploys tests, then evaluates. For evaluation, we are looking at monitoring tools. Right now, we support Prometheus, we support Dynatrace. Uh, we have somebody working on an integration with Wavefront. Um, uh, somebody's working on a Splunk integration so we can pull data out from any type of data source that tells us how good or bad a system is based on SLOs. And then once it's evaluated, then Captain provides me an option to promote. And then it goes into the next stage, deploy a test, evaluate, Promotion again, where here I have the option to say, do I want to automatically promote it? Or do I want to have a human being kind of clicking on the link? And then in my case, when we go into production, I'm actually using Captain for blue-green deployments. And then it will deploy blue-green. It then will evaluate. And if it's not good, it will actually then toggle blue-green and roll automatically back and then reevaluate. So this is kind of the uh, the use case that I, that I want to demo now. Okay. Before before going deep into mm -hmm. the demo, uh, the, we have received one question. This uh, yeah. is related about if Captain is Captain is really focused on SLI and SLO. Mm -hmm. It is, and it I is. will I will show you this. I will show you this in in a, in a bit with the demo, especially. Okay. Okay. Cool. So. What I have here, and actually because it uh, deployment takes a little bit, uh, let me just kick off a deployment. I hope you can see this all right. Um, what I'm doing now, before I explain the backend, you can see here, I'm making a call to the Captain CLI. So Captain can be controlled and triggered from the outside, either through the CLI or through an API. And all I'm saying here is Captain, I have a new artifact for a particular project, for a particular service, and here is my new image, and I'm now deploying version number four. So the reason why I'm doing this uh, is because obviously the, the captain deploys, runs some tests, evaluates, and so on. This may take a couple of minutes, but you can already see that captain in the background is already updating my Helm charts, is deploying my Helm charts because I'm using Helm for, for, uh, for delivery, um, and so on, it goes on. But let me show you what I've, what I had to do in order to set Captain up. The only thing I had to do is specify this shipyard file. Remember, shipyard we call it shipyard is the definition of a process. It's the definition of the process um, that basically uh, says what Captain should orchestrate for continuous delivery. So I have here three stages: I have dev, I have staging, and I have production. And basically, in every stage, I give some additional hints for the process orchestration, like what type of deployment strategy. Do I want direct or in production, I have blue-green? What type of tests should be executed? I have some functional tests in dev, just very simple, just API checkpoints. Uh, I have a performance peak in staging, so I'm running some JMeter performance tests. So let's say that we captain is then sending an event and says, I need a tool that can do this to run peak performance tests in that environment. And then what else do I have in production? We have um, uh, also a performance test that runs quickly to check things. I also have so-called approval strategies. So here I can basically say when um, Captain is delivering, it deploying, and then is running some tests and then evaluating, depending on that evaluation result, uh, what should happen? Should it automatically get promoted into the next stage, yes or no, depending on the evaluation result? Because we always come back with a result 
that is either pass, warning, or fail. It's a number between zero and 100. And then you can specify how this should be then propagated. So the, the only thing I had to do is I had to initially say, Captain create project. And then my project was called Captain 07 project. And then I have to give, I had to give it my shipyard file. And then it was basically my, my local shipyard, right? Like this. That's it. You the ammo. So this is the only this is the only thing I had to do. Then I had to upload, for instance, my uh, my my helm, my helm charts. So in my case, I'm choosing helm. So I had to upload helm charts. If uh, the gentleman uh, Michelle, you're using uh, concourse, maybe you wanna call a concourse pipeline. Then you just need to maybe upload a config file that tells Captain which concourse pipeline to execute for the de deployment. Right, that would be an option. So now let's go into the tool. So here I have uh, my captain. As you can see here, I have a couple of projects. I'm going to focus on the Captain 07 project. In my Captain 07 project, I have my environment. And what you can see here is I have, oops, sorry, environment. So in dev, I already have version four deployed. In staging, I have version three. And in production, I also have version three deployed. It seems I actually had a failed quality gate earlier on. Let's see what that means. It actually rolled back. This was a previous test that I did. Um, but let me just show you. I have version four deployed because that's what I just kicked off. Now my app is not very sexy, as you will see in a second, but I can click on that link here. This is a Node.js app. I just built a container with a Node.js app uh, and it does a couple of things. It gives a couple of capabilities and my tests that I've uploaded to Captain JMeter, they're just you know, executing a couple of these API calls. But this is build number four in dev. Uh, in, in staging, I have build number three still in here and in production, I also have build number three, right? And remember what I did is I specified the process and then I said, Captain, now you go off, here's a new version. So now coming to that process visualization, the environment view gives me an overview of what runs in which environment, which version of which particular service runs in which, in, in which stage. The service view gives me now an overview of the individual processes that I kicked off. So for instance, you see here the build number four that are executed at 18.28, my local time, it is currently running. It currently in dev, it did a deployment, then it ran some chain meter tests, then it started retrieving some SLIs, which in my case in dev are very minimum. I'm just doing a basic check against if the API is there. In this case, this just finished. Now it's going on and it says, hey, I have a build, now it's going into staging. It was automatically approved. So now the configuration change goes on. That means it will change my Helm charts in my Git repo and will then trigger the next process. Now this will run overall about 10, 15 minutes. So let me just go back to maybe the previous time I ran that, um, that pipeline. So just to show you everything that happens here, I have dev, it goes good. Then it goes into staging, approval, approval finished, goes down. The deployment is triggered, tests are executed, SLIs are retrieved. And then here's a little bit more of, um, of the quality gate. This is really where Captain is pulling in a lot of different SLI service level indicators, comparing them against SLOs, my objectives. And then it comes out with a score between zero and 100, as you can see and they, here I got 96. And based on that, Captain decides pass, warning or fail. And then they, depending on your promotion strategy, it either gets automatically approved into the next stage, yes or no. Okay, so this is really what it is, right? I mean, it's, it's as simple as, remember, <clears throat> defining the process and then uploading a couple of supporting files and obviously installing the right tool integrations, meaning hooking up, we call them captain services to listen to these events. And Captain internally keeps all these config files in the Git repo. And what you can also do is uh, you can you can um, specify an upstream Git, meaning when you create that project, you have the option to um, to upload uh, to, to to specify. In my case, I have a GitHub repository. So this is now, and I'm happy to also share this in the um, so that people, everybody that is online. I'm just putting the link to this. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yep. So you can explore it yourself. But let me explain what this is, right? Um, the, if I zoom in a little bigger, 
Um, when I created the project, Captain, here's my shipyard file again that I've showed you earlier, right? That's the one, it's just uploading it. And then the important thing is for every stage, Captain is automatically creating a branch. So I have a dev, a prod and a staging branch. And in every branch, I can now upload and give Captain, right, the files that the individual tools may need to do their job once they're triggered to do their job. So for instance, I have uh, for my simple node, that's my, my service under that folder. I have uh, sub, uh, subfolders for each individual, let's say type of tool, like I have my, for Helm. For Helm, I have my initial uploaded um, uh, Helm chart. And as you can see here, the values YAML file was, was, was modified three minutes ago. This wasn't me. The values YAML was updated automatically by Captain by the process because one of the one of the processes in the uh, in the delivery model is if you give Captain a new configuration change, you can pass things like hey, here's my new version, my new image, my new replica account, my new canary. Then Captain is actually saying, please, I need somebody to make this configuration change. In my case, it's the Helm service because I'm using Helm. So Helm is then updating first the config files. And after that, Helm is triggered through an event again to actually do the deployment. It's really cool. Okay, so here I have all my supporting files. I also have, um, I'm using JMeter for testing. So I have uploaded the tests that then the JMeter tool can access and use once my JMeter integration is triggered. Um, and then I know for Michelle, uh, if you have uh, concourse, you could create a concourse integration where we actually have a generic integration where you can just upload a, a, a Python script or a shell script or a, an HD and, and a, a webhook definition. And then Captain can just call a Python script for you. For instance, triggering your your uh, your, your concourse pipeline for a particular stage in the in the process. Right. Here is also where I have my SLO file. So the SLO file is, that's what's behind the scenes with how should Captain compare your, uh, the results, right? So there's like, but I'll come to this in a second when I, in my next section um, where I go into SLIs and SLOs. But this is really what it is. And the cool thing is Captain keeps rolling. So now um, uh, in my, in staging now, right? Remember earlier in prod is build number three. Let me refresh, it will still be build number three. In staging, if I refresh, now it's build number four, right? And then the idea is build number four will eventually get pushed into prod. And then the nice thing is it'll take about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, build four has a problem in prod. That's what I built in into my app. And Captain will understand that there is a problem because it always does an evaluation of my SLOs and will then trigger a rollback because that's what I specified with my blue-green deployment strategy. All right. So this is the first part. Um, a second piece that I also wanna, wanna highlight in that overview, which I will show later on is, this is the overview of kind of the, uh, the delivery part, but Captain, as you, as you also know what I explained earlier, can also uh, do remediation. So that means if a problem is detected later on, Captain also has the ability to execute a remediation workflow. So similar to the shipyard, what I've showed you, and that is describing a delivery process with remediation workflow. You can specify if a problem comes in at some point, not as part of the deployment, but later on, then you can execute certain actions and then Captain will just execute them and hope that the system gets back to a healthy state. More on this also later on. Okay. Um, and one more example from also not just me, but one of our adopters, Patrick from uh, Amazon. They are using uh, GitLab CI for building their containers. So build, test, and, and building the image. And then they're triggering uh, the Captain deployment. Or they're, then, they're then using Captain multi-stage delivery. Basically, just what I've shown you, but it is triggered from GitLab. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said you can integrate this with any type of tooling. Make sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, awesome. Yeah, I would like I would like to play a bit, but yeah, this is my yeah, <laughs> my yeah you, can, you, with, can, you, know. you you can you can play because it's open source, right? You yeah, can do this. Yeah, so the second session, and this is what uh, what what somebody asked you earlier. What about SLIs, SLOs? So 
I've shown you now kind of the architecture of Captain, why we built an event-driven model, um, and, and how and I showed you the, the delivery use case. Now I want to focus on one use case, which is the number one use case that is currently adopted by our users, which actually solves this problem here that a lot of time is spent in manual deployment validation. What means is we see a lot of people, they have their existing CI, CD pipelines, they are doing build, deploy, run some tests. And then there's typically the stage where somebody then needs to look at, okay, test results of maybe our Selenium tests, test results of our GMeter tests, maybe look at some monitoring data. And this typically takes a long, long time. And yeah. it also takes certain people that look at the data. Right? Yeah. So th this is a problem we want to solve. Now, how do we solve it? We are solving this through our SLI and SLO based quality gate. So what this means is, in case you have never heard about SLIs and SLOs, at least somebody earlier said they have never heard about it, nothing we came up with, uh, Google uh, came up with this as part of their site reliability engineering practices. Even though now, as I'm going to explain to you, you will see that didn't, they didn't reinvent the wheel. They just gave it really cool names that are catchy and obviously uh, promoted this throughout the world, which I'm very glad they did. So what this really is, it starts with service level indicators. A service level indicator is nothing else than something you can measure, some metric. As an example, what I bring here, the error rate of your login transactions. Okay, if you have a login feature, what's the error rate? This is something you can probably measure by looking at your log files, by looking at your monitoring, however. Or if you have tests, maybe your test scripts tell you that. Then the next thing is SLOs, service level objective. The service level objectives basically say, what do you expect a particular SLI to be for you to consider it successful? And this typically comes from a production scenario where you say, hey, um, we need the login error rate to be less than 2% over 30 period time, 30 day period, okay? So these are like, what is your success criteria? And then we also have SLAs. SLAs are more well-known probably, and they've been around for much longer. SLAs are like SLOs, but they basically say, what happens if we don't meet our SLOs? Do we have any legal requirement? Do we have any, any contracts where if we don't meet our SLAs, then we have to pay something? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it could be simple as if you're not faster than the competition, then maybe people go to a competitive offering. So very simple. Great videos out there from Google. If you have never seen about this, but it's 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 a it's a very simple simple concept. SLIs drive SLOs, which inform SLAs. Now, what does this mean now for us? We see that more and more organizations, and hopefully you are among them, are looking and defining SLOs for their services that are running in production for their business critical services, and they're using monitoring tools to monitor and validate them. Okay, so that means uh, whatever reporting period they have, their tools can tell them how did we measure up against our SLO and the SLO might be throughput, error rate, response time, conversion rates, whatever they have for every application, for every service. And I think this is great that a lot of people are now thinking about defining the success of the services. But what I am proposing, or what we are proposing with Captain Let's just not look at those metrics in production, but also let's look at them throughout continuous delivery. And this is where Captain Quality Gates come in. So Captain Quality Gates is a key component of the delivery process that I've showed you, also of the remediation process. But the nice thing is you can also use it standalone. And what it does, it basically automates going off to a tool, one or two or three data sources, monitoring tools, pulling the data out for a particular time frame, typically the time frame when your tests ran in your continuous delivery, and then comparing them against your objectives. What we have additionally implemented in quality gates, you can also compare it to previous builds because you wanna figure out if individual metrics maybe slowly get 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 worse. Not that you're already hitting the threshold, but maybe you see, oh, there's something strange here. And it, it, we can also compare it with previous builds with the baseline. So this is what this is. Technically, how it's implemented in Captain. Um, as, as you know, Captain is an event-driven system. That means we are we are connecting to tools through events. That means if you want to write your own SLI provider, 
if you want to pull in your own data from your own custom data source, you can write your own Captain SLI service. And I have also done a, a talk and a tutorial is out on, on YouTube how to do this in five minutes, very easy. Right now we have Dynatrace, Prometheus, Neoload, and I mentioned earlier, Weaveworks and Splunk is already in the works. But the idea how this works, in order for these tools to actually work, you first need to tell Captain what metrics are interesting for you. So you specify an SLI file. The SLI is a YAML where you say an indicator name like error rate, count, DB calls, JVM memory. And then on the right side, this is information that then the, or the individual tool can use to pull that metric. This is an example of Dynatrace queries. It could also be PromQL for Prometheus or whatever other tool you have. And then the next thing you specify is the SLO, different files. On the one side, you define what, how do you get the metrics and what metrics are important. And on the other side, you specify uh, what are your, what is your criteria. And this is what Captain then uses to compare. So really, if you say, Captain, please do the evaluation right, for a particular time frame, for a particular service, here's the SLI and SLO, then Captain is basically reaching out to these tools by sending them events. They, they say, okay, I need to get this, 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 this metric for this time frame. Here are the values. Then Captain looks at every single value, compares it against your SLO, then gives it a score or a number between zero, either zero, half a point, or one point. And then we do basically a total count, like how many points did you achieve? Now, one thing you can do, where I typically don't go into details during this presentation, but you can also give different metrics, different SLIs, different weights. By default, every metric has a weight of one, which means the maximum number of points a single SLI can achieve is one. But you can also say, let's say error rate is five times more important, so you give it a weight of five. Therefore, if it's good, it gets five points. If it is warning, it gets two and a half points. And if it's failed, it gets zero points. And you can also define individual SLIs as key SLIs. So you can, for instance, say, if error rate is bad, I don't care about the rest. The whole build should automatically fail. So you can yeah. also do this. No, that's cool, because then we don't need to do anything, let's say, manually. You know, that many, many places I've seen where you can basically prepare an environment or more than one environment and then run something manually and then get the results and then exactly. build the report and then doing everything manually. I guess that if you define more or less the objectives and where you can get the information from which particular tool, let's say, and then you can basically gather everything and you can have exactly. a look at it. Yeah. Exactly. That's what it is. It's really an automation layer of, of something actually very simple. Yeah. Well, it's not that simple, I guess, but well, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have implemented it. So now what I want to show you now is how we have implemented this in, like, in my use case. And we made this, so I work for Dynatrace. As you know, we are a monitoring uh, provider. That means we are uh, we have, we have a solution that can monitor, uh, for instance, my, my Kubernetes environment. And behind the scenes, there's still SLIs and SLO files. But one thing we've implemented is to make it easier, people can now just build a dashboard and then kept the, the Dynatrace Captain integration is just parsing that dashboard. And based on that dashboard, it just pulls out that data. So what it basically automates is instead of me looking at this dashboard and comparing it with values of previous builds or previous timeframes, Captain does this for me. It pulls out the data based on the dashboard definition and then calculates my score. And that's it. So that means if I go back to my, my demo from earlier, let's see where we are. You see this here, build number four in staging has now achieved 88 points. That's awesome. So let me show you how all of these metrics came about. So this is where I have the dashboard link. <clears throat> so this is just an integration, as I said, especially built uh, for, for Dynatrace to make this a little easier, but for Prometheus it's similar. Um, but we, I basically just put metrics on this dashboard that I would normally look at manually. And on these dashboards, we also uh, specify what are my objectives. You can see it here. Let me actually go in. Uh, I can specify uh, pass and warning criteria. And here's where you can actually see the power. I can say, Captain, this is my SLI that I call service response time P95 because it's the 95th percentile of my response time of that service. You can specify a pass criteria of it has to be faster than 600 milliseconds. But also, it should not get slower than 10% plus of the previous build. So 
SLOs are always expressed in a positive way. So it's passing if it is smaller than 600 and if it is smaller than plus 10% of the previous build. And I can also then specify warning. I could say warning is a, is a thousand. And then I could, as I mentioned earlier, I could specify a weight of five, which means five times more important than anything else. I could also say key equals true, which means this is a key SLI. If this one fails, the whole the whole evaluation should fail. Can you can you just because I, we are we are trying to read it? I think it's not read it, reading very well. Can you try to copy it and and for example the chat and see? Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, because I I see it's not. Oh, not much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, in a declarative way, you can describe, let's say, the conditions you want to. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, let me go to my regular Zoom uh, session and. Um, and the thing is, behind the scenes, what is happening is we are obviously creating, let me go back to my, if you're still on the GitHub repo from earlier maybe, and if you look at, for instance, staging, then you can see what the integration actually did. If you go under simple node, that's my service. And if you go under Dynatrace, then there's this, there's an SLI.yaml. So, this would be the YAML file that I would have needed to create manually to define the queries of my tool to pull out that data. But with this dashboard approach, we just automated that, right? But, but it's still, you can also write this manually and you can you maintain your YAML files, but the integration just automatically creates that. So these are all the, the queries, right? The, the SLIs and then the query language behind the scenes. And then also the, the SLO is also automatically created based on the information I've specified in the declarative way in my dashboard. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and that's the nice thing. So in the, this is, we call this the heat map. So you can see here, I'm looking at the last build and it, you see a little shadow here because if you are specifying a comparison, if you're doing this percentage numbers, that means you're comparing it with the previous build. Um, you, you also see against which build it was compared to. And I specified always compare it to the last good build. So in this case, this build was not compared against this one because this one failed. And you can also say, do you want to compare it against multiple builds? Do you want to uh, calculate a baseline across multiple builds? There's a lot of things possible. Uh, we also see we have a chart visualization here. So you can see trends over time from either the score or let's say individual metrics, right? So I'm, I'm pulling in a lot of metrics and you can see how, how things evolve and so on and so forth, yeah. Yeah. And the nice thing is you can use this standalone, right? So uh, what I can do, for instance, this is now part of my delivery, but I can also, I have Jenkins here and I have my Captain Quality Gate. And this is again for Michelle that is using a, a concourse. Yeah. So I can just trigger just a workflow just for quality gates from any CI CD tool. And in my case, I'm using Jenkins. So here I have a pipeline that is basically asking Captain, please, Captain, I have set up a project that is called Quality Gate, Stage Quality Stage, and then Evil Service. And I want to evaluate a certain time frame. You have different options with time frames, but this is one of them giving you a seconds, or like a seconds in the past. So now what my Jenkins does, it makes a rest call to Captain, say, please go off and whatever SLI and SLO configuration you have for this project, reach out to these tools, let them pull in the metrics and then do your calculation and then respond to me what, what, you, what you have. Um, and in this case, success, look at this, it's actually good. Everything is good. That means it's a good build and I can, I have a link directly to that Captain's Bridge. So in this case, this is a different project. As you can see, it's called Quality Gate Project. Uh, and, but it's the same concept. But now instead of doing a full deploy, run some tests, I just started the process with the evaluation. And then the process stops when the evaluation is done. This is the nice thing. So we don't have to do the end-to-end -end process. You can also pick individual pieces and integrate this in your tools. Yeah, so basically even you have your own, let's say, system, your, your CI already working, let's say you only, you, you can use Captain just to get, to, to use as a quality gate, no? To, to mm -hmm. gather all the results and see how your exactly. system are behaving compared exactly. to, no, to the actual, let's say, situation, yeah. Exactly. Okay. 
And I know, I mean, I've seen people build things like this themselves, right? But this is now part of our open source project um, mm -hmm. and easy to extend. Yeah. Good. So uh, let me quickly go back to my slides. Um, just as I mentioned, you can integrate this. Christian from, from EOT, they've also integrated this in their GitLab pipeline. They're using GitLab for deploy, for testing, but then for verify, they just trigger the evaluation. So this would be kind of like one scenario, how easy it is to integrate this and automate an otherwise manual task. Yeah. Good. Brings me to the last thing, um, the last problem we are solving besides the delivery, the quality gate, this is a st time spent in, in troubleshooting and remediations of problems in production. And we here we also, with Captain, provide an, an SRE-driven, we call it closed-loop SRE-driven remediation workflow. So what this means, and you've seen this earlier a little bit with the remediation file, um, you can have Captain and you can have your monitoring tool to when the monitoring tool, let's say a Prometheus alert comes in, or in this case, it's a Dynatrace problem, can send that problem to Captain. And then in Captain, you can specify a remediation workflow. So it is similar to the delivery workflow, but it's this is now a different declaration because we are trying to solve slightly different problems here. So you specify the remediation workflow in a so-called remediation YAML file. So what Captain does, it sees the problem coming in, it tries to figure out, it tries to map that problem with the Captain project because Captain is always organized in projects, in stages, and in services. So it tries to map it based on the metadata of that problem. Then it says, hey, do we have a remediation file uploaded for this problem? And if so, yes, then let's execute the first action. And what executing the first action actually means, remember, Captain is an event-driven system. So it sends an event, which then is then picked up by whatever tool you have specified to listen to that event. So it could be scaling up. And then if the action is executed, Captain will evaluate if your system goes back to a healthy state. And if not, executes the next action. And then again, evaluate. And if nothing works, then you can also escalate, obviously. You can then, let's say, send a notification to Slack or something like this. So this is one thing we've built for uh, remi for for orchestrating workflows for auto remediation in production. Now, while this is really cool, I think uh, a lot of people say, nah, this is a little too scary if you try this in production the first time. <laughs> <laughs> probably yes, yes. Many people, probably. I can see many, many DevOps saying, oh, probably yes, but no. <laughs> yeah. So this is why I really love chaos engineering because I think if we are bringing this into an into an environment, let's say pre-prod or your chaos environment, where you run load and then chaos, first of all, chaos engineering allows you to validate that your monitoring works correctly, that your monitoring actually triggers the problems that you're expecting. And then you can battle test and define and really make sure that your auto remediation workflows work and bring the system back to its healthy state even though there might be chaos in the system so basically what this is this is for me test driven operations because we are writing operational code here which is the declaration of this workflow and the actions that are executed but they need to be tested because nothing should end up in production that is not tested and so i think this is a a, a great example and we also have integrations with litmus cows we're working with gremlin um but i mean in the end in any type of chaos tool you know works here but yeah. we have integrations with litmus which is another open source project yeah cool cool yeah because basically you, do, you don't need to know to be scary let's say you can try first and see how it behaves and then yeah exactly yeah <laughs> so to wrap it up Hopefully, remember what is Captain. Captain is about you bring your use case, you then bring your configuration, you connect your tools, and then Captain automates these use cases for you by connecting to your tools. Everything is declarative, SLOs at the core, everything is standard based. And we built it to really help organizations in their transformation, right? Captain is really addressing these problems that I raised earlier. And if you wanna 
give it a try. There's many material, there's a lot of material out there. Uh, Tutorials.capnsh is one way to get started. It would also be great if people want to contribute. Uh, we are an open source project, so we, we live from contributions, obviously, from people that actually actively contribute. So that would be great. Um, yeah, and now I would be happy to get a little more questions. Yeah, there is at least one question. Thank you, by the way, Andy. It was a great presentation. I like it very much. Yeah, and you. I would like to, to give you just yeah, this word. So well, there's one there's one question, I think, because uh, one colleague arrived late. Uh -huh. And I don't know if you can see the question, but basically he is asking about the, how does it fit when you have many microservices and you want to deploy any of them? I, I don't know if he's already asking mm -hmm. about how to coordinate the deployment of the different microservices was just wondering how the deployment of one. Yeah. yeah. So if you have multiple, if you have many microservices, the idea is that if I go back to my project, then you would have for every microservice in a project or for every microservice that belongs to an application, you will basically uh, onboard your services. We call it onboard a service to a project where you can give it either the Helm chart or whatever else you have. And then you can send, um, if you have a new version of your microservice, you can then exactly say, I want to now deliver this new version of this particular microservice. And then the process goes on. Now, this is also why this view makes a lot of sense. I know I only have one service here right now. Uh, some of the tutorials, that we have uh, using hipster store, which has a couple of microservices and also sock shop. So it's a little more elaborate on, on the number of services, but this basically then gives you the overview, which version of which microservice runs in which particular environment. It also tells you if like in this case, remember build number four, I've never actually let it into production because my process has said, I have to have a human interaction. So if you have, let's say 10, 20, 30 microservices, you can send captain events every time when you have a new version and maybe in dev you automatically deploy you run the tests and then maybe also in staging you let them through if everything is good but, but, but for production you will basically end up seeing which new versions of microservices are here that made it through all the way into production but has not yet been allowed because you've specified uh, manual approval so here you get an overview then simple node version 4 is available you get the overview of the results of your SLOs, and then you can decide what you want to do. And I now decide that I want to let it into mm -hmm. production, which means now it's going to deploy it. Now, what we don't have right now is some, let's say, release bracketing around, um, let's say, multiple services that should always be deployed together. But what you can do if this if this is something you have and you say always there are microservices, but essentially they are kind of like a monolithic service some, some belonging <laughs> together they're, they're basically linked one to each other no and then they have to be coupled by any yeah if they, if they're tightly coupled for whatever reason you can obviously also create a so-called service here and and then when you deploy that service it may deploy multiple artifacts uh, mm -hmm. and again because you can use helm for that you can you can call a jenkins pipeline you can do whatever whatever tool that can do this then for you Okay, I guess this the, the question was 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 answered already. Yeah. So I, I, have... I also see there's like too much YAML and not user friendly. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that's that's obviously a, a, a an answer of preference, right? I, I'm also not happy with YAML all the time, but the thing is, when we talk about configuration as code and everything as code, there's a spe there's a lot of either YAML or JSON or whatever it is, right? Um, I'm, more happy, I, I'm also more happy with XML files, you know. With XML files, yeah. You know, the, the old XML files. Are you, still the, in, are you still in the 90s or early 2000s? Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, you're right. I mean, and the thing is, just because we are using YAML for the core configuration in Captain doesn't mean that your service, that you're on board, that where you connect your tool needs to use YAML. You can do whatever you want, right, in the end. Um, and maybe one example of making this user friendly is exactly this here. We allow users to point and click and put the dashboards together, which define the SLOs that should be used for the quality gate evaluation. So hopefully that we were taking that away completely. Yeah. There's another question. Uh, 
Uh, Michelle already asked, uh, can we integrate Captain to replace our events manager, Elasticsearch, or the cloud provider event manager, since we already have our own Cycloid DevOps framework, which automate all deployment pipelines? Yeah. Oh. So I don't think you want to, honest answer, I don't think you want to replace your events manager that you have right now, because I assume your organization is using that events manager for much more than just delivery, right? So I, 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 again, I don't know enough what you're doing. It would be interesting, Michelle, to have a, a discussion later on. Um, unless you have built something custom that does exactly what Captain does, then you have, you can make the decision, do you want to keep building something yourself and maintain it? Or do you see how Captain can help you? It's an open source project that is maintained well, and therefore you are um, yeah, you're not required to build and maintain a complete product of your own. Um, but if, if you say Elasticsearch or the cloud provider event manager, then typically what I've seen, these event managers are typically used for many, many things where all of your tools can send events and you're connecting your business applications are connecting through this. So, yeah. Okay, don't know if there are any other last questions. Uh, I wish to have this hello. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Michelle, SLO, right? I'm not sure <clears throat> which monitoring tool do you use, Michelle? By the way, I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Oh, me too. <laughs> Because if you have a monitoring tool, if you get some type of value uh, of data, then I can Prometheus Gravana, perfect, right? Then you can go to uh, tutorials, <clears throat> Captain, do they either the Captain full tour on Prometheus, or there's also I think a quality gate for Prometheus somewhere. But I think the the full tour on Prometheus shows you how how this works in general, and you know try it out. Give it a try and um, let Captain automate the extraction of important metrics. And there's also um, my colleague Jürgen has done uh, some Captain Prometheus Metzl stuff. Uh, um, oh, that's something else. Captain Prometheus Metzl stuff. Huh? Um, he did uh, some really cool blog posts and also presentations at meetups recently on Prometheus. There we go. I think that's a good one. Um, let me send that in the chat window. Yep. And this is a read. This is something you should read. Let's see which one is newer. This is May. This one here. And then also, Michelle, I, I see you've just sent the link. So there's a lot of homework here. Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay, so you built your own framework that simplifies. Okay, we should probably talk on how we can, how Integrate. we can collaborate, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what it looks like. Okay, so I don't know if uh, anyone else has any more questions. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Michelle wants to talk to you later yeah. on. Yeah, reach out to me. Um, you can reach out to me either on Twitter or um, on the Captain Slack channel. So it's slack.captain.sh and you obviously know my name, it's Andreas Gardner. And you can also LinkedIn or Slack, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I think that's it for, for today. Uh, I have to say it was a great, great uh, event, uh, Andy. And I have to say thank you for your presentation and uh, yeah. for all the people that, was, uh, that, that were here. Thank you very much. If you want to, let's say, uh, join us, it will be a really pleasure. If you want to contact Andy, I think he will be really happy to try to answer yeah. any questions. If not, uh, just stay safe, uh, stay at home, and yeah, hope to see you soon at some point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So have fun. Thank you very much, Andy, for your time. Gracias, adios. Uh, gracias. Chao. Chao, chao.